So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Carbon Brief's post-election webinar, where we're going to be talking about the key climate priorities for the next UK, uh, the new UK government. And um, for those of you uh, that maybe aren't in the UK or if you've been asleep for the past week, um, just, just to, to give you the background, Labour, the Labour Party's just won a historic landslide victory in the UK election, ending 14 years of Conservative rule. And to discuss what that means for climate action um, in the country, I'm joined today by three fantastic panellists. So we've got um, Emma Pinchbeck, who's Chief Executive of en uh, Energy UK, um, joined by some unfortunately sick children um, uh, who are gracing us also with their presence. Um, we've got Adam Bell, who's the Director of Policy at uh, Stonehaven. And we've got Camilla Bourne, who's an independent climate advisor and former UK senior official at the COP26 climate talks. Now, uh, the eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that, that Adam is not Chris Stark. Um, sadly, Chris has had to pull out at the last minute. Um, now, just before we start uh, the conversation, I'd like to thank all of those um, who sent questions in in advance. Um, we've had loads of great questions, which we're going to be asking the panel um, today. Um, and just to remind you that if, if anyone else in the audience has has questions for the panellists, please do add them to the Q&A and we'll, we'll do our best to get through as many of them as possible. Um, so to start the conversation, I'm going to hand you over to our policy section editor, Molly Lempriere. Thanks, Simon. So just to start with, I'd like to ask each of our panellists what, in their expert opinions, the number one priority for delivering on climate change is for the new UK government. Um, Adam, I wonder if you could kick us off. Uh, certainly. Um, thanks very much, Molly. So the IPC thinks that the entire world should reduce emissions from 2020 levels by half by 2030. Now, this is almost an unprecedented scale of change. And so I think the most single greatest contribution the UK can make to this is around the politics of pace and demonstrating what is possible, retaining public support for very, very rapid change. And what's key here is the 2030 power decarbonisation target. Delivering that would mean that we have done what no nation has ever done, fully decarbonized our, powers, our, our power system within five years. Now, delivering that is very much kind of almost an Apollo style mission. You've got to organize almost the entirety of government behind it. You've got to reconfigure planning, reconfigure the way in which Ofgem enables investment in great infrastructure, um, find ways of binding in the, the public to this, uh, to this vision. Otherwise, it will be extremely challenging. You've got to reform CFDs. You've got to reform the way in which you, the capacity market, it binds so much of what the government wants to do that um, without delivering, without focusing it above everything else, it just won't happen. Thanks, Helen. Emma? Good news is the sick children are now in another room. Um, so, I mean, we're all going to say most, more or less the same thing, right? But I think that statistic about emissions peaking and declining is really important. And the, the really big swing factor internationally on whether or not emissions start declining is largely around the deployment of renewables and the, them beginning to bite into demand for fossil fuel. That even in the UK still applies for power. So I think we need to see a massive rollout of infrastructure of the kind that we haven't seen for the past decades, decades, plural, talking about sort of seven times the amount of infrastructure over the next 10 years that we've built over the previous three, largely in the power sector. But at the same time, I think the UK has this opportunity to show what electrification and clean technologies can do on the demand side. And because we are relatively far ahead with the decarbonisation of power, how you use green electricity through the energy system to start decarbonising other areas of the economy. And in particular, if you think about the UK carbon budgets, the big gaps and the big challenges are all around heat and transport decarbonisation. We're in that period in the carbon budgets, fourth and fifth carbon budgets, where it has been quite challenging to get people off individual boilers and onto new technologies. I think we've got the real opportunity to do that. And because of the energy crisis, I think people understand our exposure to imported gas for heat and for power as well. So that chance to make electric technologies cheaper, to make a play for national security, as well as to reduce emissions. That's the, the big the big stuff we want to see done over the next five years. Um, so that's the, I mean, that's the, the big challenge, as Adam says, is to kind of get emissions starting to decline. Most of that is still in energy and in particular with rolling out infrastructure and starting to tackle the demand side. 
Emma and Camilla. Thanks, Molly. And and just to build on exactly what Adam and Emma have talked about. So from an international standpoint, the number one thing that needs to be done um, by the UK on this agenda is to deliver at home. And that's because we've moved on um, from a discussion internationally about what are our big framework agreements that we need to put in place. And that's where we were 14 years ago. Last time there was a Labour government where we didn't even have a global agreement. And now we need to really show what we're doing at home to deliver the UK massively punches above its weight on what we're doing on the the transition internationally and people watch what we're doing and that is in both policy terms but also in political terms so on policy terms yes we're not part of the EU anymore we can't shape that market in the same way but we have done many things through um, the last few decades which really have set a precedent if that's the Climate Change Act or if that's CFDs and continuing to show that policy innovation to do really smart things that get copied will be really, really critical. On the political side, we are also moving into uncharted territory. We've done a lot of the low hanging fruit um, as similar to what's been seen across Europe as well. But arguably the country where people are looking to and saying, where's the the biggest, most profound transition going on is, is China. And that is not a democracy. The UK is a democracy. We are having to deliver at pace as Adam is saying. And we need to be thinking about what that looks like and managing that political um, set of dynamics and showing that climate policy, climate action is something that is persistent and provides dividends both economically, but also politically to keep moving us along in the transition. So delivering at home so that we can project project internationally would be the, the most important piece for me. Thanks, Camilla. And one of the big things about delivering at home and that we, which Adam and Emma in particular has already touched on, um, but which we're already confident our audience is going to have a lot of questions about, um, is Labour's manifesto pledge to reach zero carbon power by 2030. Um, so the panel, I'd like to quickly ask, what do the panel think Labour will, will do the panel think Labour will be able to stick to the 2030 target and what might stop them from getting there? Um, Emma, I wonder if you could jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, we said in, in opposition and the said to the new government, it's a challenging target and you'll hear lots of people saying that, but it's not that much more challenging than what the um, last government were committed to in terms of 2035. When you look at it, the, the biggest priority is building a lot more stuff that's clean. And I think Labour have talked about, you know, uh, increasing the amount of solar, onshore wind, offshore wind they're building. It's a good sign that they've already removed the planning restriction on onshore wind as a kind of statement of intent. So lots more clean energy capacity. They'll also need to pretty quickly get on with confirming the new nuclear sites because they're in the carbon budgets and in the power sector decarbonisation pathways. Um, and they'll need clarity on the what we call the flexible bit of the power system, so the complementary power to renewable renewables. And in fact, the biggest difference between 2030 and 2035 isn't the extra renewables you need to build this side of the decade. It is the additional flexible generation. So that's obviously things like storage and batteries and the, the stuff that sits alongside renewables, but it is also decarbonizing gas as cheaply as possible and deciding how much unabated gas you're keeping on the system for emergencies and how much of that gas you decarbonize through things like hydrogen or carbon capture. Those technologies for decarbonizing gas are in really their infancy at the moment. And if I was going to throw kind of expertise and pace at anything, it's on that kind of question about how you do the flexible generation bit of the mix to make sure we have secure supply as well as decarbonize at speed. So it's all of that. And then on top of that, it's the kind of nuts and bolts of building projects. You need a lot of money to come into the country because 90% of the capital for these infrastructure projects is coming from the private sector. And there's competition now from the US, from Europe, from other markets for it. And you do that by making it really easy to build projects here. As you set a really secure long-term signal that this is what you're planning on doing. 2030 actually helps with that because it's ambitious. But then you make clear through things like how you're delivering. So kind of clear delivery structures in Whitehall, sticking to your carbon budgets and your legislative framework, stability for your markets. And then underneath that planning reform for things like building everything from grid infrastructure 
through to actual projects on the ground. And again, we had the chance to talk about that yesterday. So there's that. The, the, the third thing as a kind of enabler is about people, we need enough skills and a big enough workforce and all the components and the kit and the kind of materiality of the projects to actually deliver. And that will mean working quite closely with the Department for Education and the Business Department just again to get in the stuff, the physical stuff and the people that we need to build. So it's a big old heavy lifting exercise. The early signs from the new government are quite good. You know, they've obviously done a lot of thinking about this. And, and the most important thing is moving at pace. And we've had a series of announcements and meetings and things straight off the back of the election. And that will reassure the industry and investors that the government understands how fast we need to move to get 2030 done. Adam, is there anything else you'd like to add on that? Um, so I think there was three other things, things I'd point to. The first is, yeah, well, obviously, I believe Labour can do it, but the, the biggest challenge they're going to have are going to be the pile on wars that are going to erupt in the middle of, in the middle of this parliament when the public realise actually we're going to build another 500 kilometres worth of pylons on shore as well as all the substations that have to necessarily connect about 2,000 kilometres worth of additional subsea cables. The politics that are going to be really hard. Labour have won in places that they never expected to. Some of those um, new connections will run through those constituencies and maintaining a parliamentary consensus behind the target is going to be really, really tricky when you're fighting internally over where exactly the pylons go my solution would be very much to go as fast as you possibly can um, to, um, to, in order to provide consent for these projects almost before um, the parliamentary party realises how the entire system works. That might be slightly too cynical. Um, the second is around overall costs. I think there's a number for new turbines, new gas, gas with carbon capture and storage and other forms of assets beyond which it doesn't make sense to do 2030. And how you may keep costs down during this period is going to be critical. And that goes to the sorts of instruments you use to de deploy those sorts of assets. Um, the third is very much around, um, how do I put this? It is around a workforce, as Emma said, but it's also about how you import highly skilled labor. There are already issues with getting people with the right um, equipment to build Hinkley C, for example, issues with the Home Office holding up um, visas. It goes to the whole government point that you know, Camilla had touched on. Well, you need to get persuade the Home Office that it is okay to allow immigrants in if they're going to be building things you need for your 2030 target. Yes, you can skill up people here, but you know, even if everyone graduated, graduating high school this year goes into engineering, you're still almost certainly going to be short of the skills that you need. Thanks um, for those questions. I'm just going to uh, abuse my um, uh, position in the chair and uh, ask one more before we turn to the audience questions. Um, so the, the previous government um, ditched the industrial strategy from the title of the department that's now um, the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero, formerly um, uh, uh, Bayes with industrial strategy as part of that. Um, but we've already seen Labour leaping into negotiations since taking office on Friday over the future of major industrial sites such as Port Talbot Steelworks in Wales and the Grangemouth Refinery in Scotland. Um, so I just w was wondering... Um, Maybe if we could start with Adam, what, what are you hoping to see from this government in terms of climate related industrial strategy? So I think Paul Talbot is a, is a case in point. The reason why government keeps having uh, almost um, bail out Paul Talbot every time is because this energy prices are so expensive. I think in a kind of coherent industrial strategy, you have to figure out if I'm going to have these industries in the UK, how do I ensure that their power is cheap and how do I intervene to ensure that that happens? You need to be at a national level or you can do things like say, OK, we're going to have green, green steel with vast amounts of power demand. So we're going to copy the you know, the old aluminium smelter that used to um, feed off the power from Milfa. And we're going to build a new small modular reactor or an advanced modular reactor just to give you the power you need for this. And you're going to have it at cost because we can do that where the government. Um, you need to have that sort of joined up thinking about how you get power to these sorts of assets, how you ensure that the UK has extraordinarily low industrial power prices as part of the transition. That means not relying just on the market to deliver. It means intervening in specific locations where you're creating, say, very, very low cost energy zones, purely for the purpose of ensuring that you can benefit from decarbonisation and capture some of these sectors more readily. 
Thanks. Um, but before we, we move on, I wonder just just on the international perspective, Camilla, like, I mean, you already mentioned the UK punches above its weight and, you know, people really do look to the example set here, you know, the the, the coal phase out being being the big example. And, you know, obviously, obviously one of the criticisms that's leveled against climate action is, is the the risks of it, you know, in terms of deindustrialization. Uh, um, I mean, do you think it really matters for the, you know, what how the UK manages that transition for its industries uh, in, internationally? I think we're under scrutiny, like all countries are, especially as we move into a different chapter of the, the transition. So absolutely, it does matter. I think that what we're moving to is beyond a kind of idea of climate diplomacy, which is just about aligning around different positions in multilateral fora, which remains important, but is also a conversation about transition diplomacy, i.e. what are the level of state subsidies that are being invested in different sectors? What is the R&D in a particular technology going on? And that feeds into a much broader understanding of our geopolitical and geoeconomic relationships. So we have some really big choices ahead of us in terms of what relationships we want with the rest of the world. What relationship we do, do we want with the EU? That will be really critical for the, our domestic implementation. Geography matters. We share the North Seas with many EU and non-EU countries, Norway in particular, and, and we'll have to work that out. So yes, absolutely What how we manage things going forward will be critical, but we are also part of an international picture and we'll have to make some choices about how much onshoring, how much friendshoring and how much outsourcing do we want to continue to do as part of this transition. And that is really the name of the game now. This isn't just a conversation about, oh, isn't it a nice moral thing to do to take action on climate change? No, this is about having a modern and competitive economy. And people will look to the UK to work out how are we having a modern and competitive economy? And not just because are we leading on climate change, but are we being modern and competitive? Are we somewhere that people want to invest? And so the choices that we make will be precedent setting because we're so advanced in the transition. Emma, it looks like you, you might want to add add, a, add your own thoughts to that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know everyone on the call, but I've been in this job for five years. And when I took it, it was to, to talk about, you know, net zero as part of the energy transition, having come from the environmental movement and that being my background. And the nature of the energy crisis is that I've spent the last five years talking about affordable energy and energy security, which is completely the right thing, given where we are with the country. I've got record numbers of people who are still unable to pay their energy bills. I've got businesses who mainly want to talk to me about energy pricing, as Adam said. And I think because of the invasion of Ukraine, there is when we poll people on this, there is more of an understanding that exposure to international gas markets or international fossil fuel markets where we cannot control the price easily, even as a producer because the markets are international is something which is an economic security risk and and a broader security risk and broadly I think that's actually quite a good thing for talking about tackling climate change because there is a dawning understanding amongst politicians of all kinds whatever their kind of political background that clean technologies are cheaper and that they are the backbone of a modern energy economy, but also probably one that is more resilient to those kinds of price shocks. And, you know, the ONS, um, the Office for National Statistics in this country, has been clear that another gas crisis would cost the UK economy something like 50 billion quid if there's another spike, which it is entirely possible that there will be with the state of the markets in, you know, the next 10 years or so. So I think, as Camilla said, and as and as Adam said, that thinking about this as an industrial opportunity is, is about cheap electricity prices, is about how we get the benefits of the energy transition to people and businesses as fast as possible, and how you demonstrate that you can deliver environmental benefit, but with kind of traditional economic benefits attached is a very good thing in the age that we're in. Yeah. Um... Oh, we're going to move on to some audience questions now. So firstly, thank you to everyone who emailed some in, in advance, um, including Namira Hamid from Climate Outreach, who said, whether it's putting up more pylons, getting more EVs or cycling or insulating homes, most of what we have to do over the next five years needs people to be on board, given distrust in politics and the active attempts of some to polarise net zero, does the panel agree that public engagement should be every bit as high a priority as economics or tech? Um, Emma's nodding a lot, so maybe we should go straight back to you. Yes, 
Uh, it's been, it's actually, we, we had a paper that went out to kind of officials and folks developing policy in this pre-general election period. And one of the things we said is there needs to be a decent communications campaign on the changes coming. I think there's a couple of things to say. The first is that the public always, always, always says that environment is a critical issue. It's slightly further down, we can have a fight about this, but it's slightly further down in most polls than it was maybe two or three years ago, simply because the cost of living crisis is where it is and you know, people are worried about other things first. But it's still a top five political issue. That said, and you're seeing this in some of the political responses this week, often people are pro-environment but uncomfortable with building infrastructure. And the reality of decarbonisation for the next 10 years is we need to build a lot of stuff um, with in, in communities. We need to, in homes, in terms of changing over boilers, in the kind of national environment, in terms of things like pylons. There are some alternatives to doing that. So you can minimise some of that visual and other impact in, in local areas. But there is often a big cost attached to it, although it just isn't a technical alternative. And so the thing that I'm often saying to environmentalists at the moment is how willing they are to come with us on, on the very clear road to net zero, which is building a lot of things and helping kind of communicate the benefits of that to the public. The last time we did something like this in the 1970s, when we put lots of pylons across places like Wales um, in order for them to have electricity, <laughs> we there was a kind of big comms campaign and people wrote out in sort of rural magazines and in the kind of big broadsheet newspapers talking about the fact that if we didn't do this, there would be economic consequences for people's children. If we didn't do this, then people in Wales couldn't have electricity when people in London could. And I think we need a similar national effort to kind of talk to people about why we're doing it and why it benefits them. And then very lastly, you can have all the comms campaigning that you want, but you do also actually have to have people feel this. And I think I'm very interested, particularly having seen the results of the general election, and the rise of populism in the UK and Europe. I am very interested in any policy mechanisms that we have where the state can bring forward the benefits to as many households as possible of the net zero transition earlier in the decade than they otherwise would come through. And by that, I mean, it's gonna take, you know, five to 10 years to build the infrastructure and then the economic benefits of replacing things like gas and generating clean electricity sort of come through the second half of the decade. I think it's going to be necessary for us to bring forward some of that so people kind of can feel the transition earlier. And that is the point of the state intervening in markets. And so we're all starting to think about how we do that in industry. And I'd like to see the government put some more thought to it too. Um, the next question is from Anne Karen Sather from the Norwegian Climate Foundation, who asked, what could be the significance of Labour's new oil policy for the international debate on fossil energy? Camilla, I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Thanks. I mean, I think it's very helpful because it sets a precedent and that's something that can then be mirrored and copied. So again, scrutiny again <laughs> on the UK, maybe a small economy, but nonetheless, it is a big enough economy and it is precedent setting and doing something effective. So I think that there will be a lot of attention paid and thinking through how does the UK manage this? How does it manage the fallout of it? How does it do it in a responsible way? And therefore, how can it be done elsewhere? It is very difficult to be asking particularly developing countries who have a whole range of development priorities, not dissimilar to ours, but nonetheless in a slightly different phase of their development to do these things when advanced economies like the UK aren't doing them. So if we can start splitting away that dynamic, that can be really constructive. So absolutely setting precedent and potentially as well, if as we move down that pathway, we can also, as we have done with coal, think about, OK, what are those lessons learned? And therefore, how can we work with others to support them to think about what they want to try and achieve in their own economies, too? So it will definitely put a spring into the step. It will be interesting to see what role the UK plays um, to support it internationally. And um, yeah, watch this space, I guess. Uh, the next is from Isabel Morris from the RSPB, who asked, how can the new government ensure that measures to advance en the energy transition also support nature's recovery? Um, Adam, because we haven't picked on you yet. Um, uh, that's obviously a very, very easy question. Um, I think the 
I think everything here involves trade-offs, as Emma uh, uh, touched on before. When you construct new infrastructure, it will have an impact on the environment, that is clear. Um, and I think the question about how you manage the pace of infrastructure build-out versus the impact on nature is also equally, equally important. Uh, I think in order to do that, you can't necessarily purely have the kind of a current planning regime in place. You can't have the sort of detailed analysis of every single project. So what you might want to do instead is look what the Spanish do, which is identify broad, broad areas of the country where you where there are particular reasons to protect nature, so significantly bigger than existing SSIs or, or national parks, and say we are going to preserve preserve these areas and um, for particular reasons. But everywhere else. You can do what you want and you don't have to undertake an environment impact assessment. I think that helps. It allows you to identify where you are going to further kind of um, enrich ecosystems, where you are going to enable and um, further rewilding while at the same time building the sorts of assets that you acquire. Now, obviously, the process of designating where there are is going to be politically challenging in itself. But without that, I, I don't think you can deliver 2030. And then a question from Jenny Bird from the Grantham Institute. Uh, there are not a great, there was not a great deal in the Labour manifesto about adaptation. What should be the priorities for the new government in this area? Um, back to Camilla. Oh, adaptation, the thing that no one wants to talk about, but we all know that really needs to get done. Um, so, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll pick on on the kind of most topical area just as a place to start, which is water. Um, so we all know that our water infrastructure is something that we've all thought has kind of been functioning nicely in the background. And now it is not. Um, it is very old um, and it has to deal with not only the fact that it's old and, and needs replacing, but also we're putting additional stresses on it, including climate change as well as population growth, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that is one example where we know we're going to have to have huge amounts of investment to be able to cope with um, the new pressures that that water will be under. Um, and we need to be much better at thinking about what does climate mean for the sustainability and the durability and the cost effectiveness as a result of that infrastructure. So if um, we're going to see a, a period, as Emma has talked about, of lots of building, of lots of things happening, we need to be much more savvy about what world are we building for so it is no one's fault. Um, there's no point in pointing any fingers that we live in a world that we've never lived in before. But it is someone's fault if we don't think about how that world is going to unfold and unfurl to, to, to move forward. So I think what's going to be really critical is integrating an understanding of what the future of our country looks like when we're making these interventions to be able to, to take that forward. There will be additional things that we need to do as well. But as a rule of thumb, I think that is a really smart place to start and something that hasn't been done systematically to date. Emma and Adam, I know you nodded along to quite a lot of that. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Just on the... Oh, Adam, you go... Uh, um, the, I think the water point is critical when you think about energy infrastructure in particular. There's often, for example, high water needs for the sorts of infrastructure that we're building we already contribute to, for example, the adaptation report done by the Committee on Climate Change. I think there are some practical policy recommendations. For example, there is an adaptation committee with the Committee on Climate Change. We hear a lot about the mitigation committee, but rarely about the adaptation work that they do. So putting some of that existing very good work onto a um, more established footing, I think, with the government, you know, working it into things like the national infrastructure assessments, that kind of thing would be sensible. And... There's a, this is really, really nerdy, so forgive me, but we need to do more spatial planning. We've already heard about Adam talking about could you have zones for where we can do faster development than in other places? How do you do? How do you protect habitats? How do you build enough housing for people? How do you build enough energy infrastructure for people? How do you do that and make sure it's also climate resilient? Where does the water resource come from? You know, that, that kind of exercise is a massive spatial planning exercise. And you've heard government talking about spatial planning. We'll talk about it. But the critical thing for that is it needs to be as joined up as possible across government departments and across objectives in policy. So you need the kind of DEFRA department to be thinking about this stuff alongside whatever we're doing for housing and communities alongside what we're doing for energy. And so in the early days of the new government, I'm looking for some of those cross Whitehall delivery mechanisms and how they're going to do some really geeky work on things like planning to make sure that we get infrastructure in the right place, um, as well as building it as fast as possible. 
Um, just lastly, globally, we need to do a lot more on climate financing and adaptation. And I think, you know, Camilla talked about the soft power of the UK. We have a new government. I would really like them to see stepping up on our, yes, delivery at home, but also on meeting our international commitments and in particular with climate financing, starting to move some of the money internationally and um, for mitigation and, and adaptation purposes. Um, uh, very, very quickly, I want to slightly disagree with Camilla. I think there are people that we can blame, um, specifically around um, water. We've known for well over a decade that the southeast was going to be faced with significant water sc scarcity as a result of climate change and increased demand. And we have singularly failed to build new infrastructure to manage that. So there's an absence of new reservoirs, especially around Cambridge. There's no additional um, large scale national almost water transmission system to carry water from the uh, the less less parched northwest. All those new bits of infrastructure, again, do represent trade-offs against nature, but are vital uh, parts of our uh, adaptation. And especially if the government wants to build new houses, they are going to need to make sure that they are building infrastructure that is proof against the future to support those new towns and those new properties. Thanks, all. Um, moving on, we have a question in the chat from Anna Ford on the rising tide of right wing populism around the world, which she says feels like it could seriously hamper efforts to tackle the rising urgency of climate crisis. How does the panel think we and the UK government can tackle the climate crisis in this context? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in first on that one. So on this, I think it's important to realise that a lot of the reasons why people are voting for populist parties are because they feel they've been ignored, their lives are not improving, and that government has largely, largely ignored them. Those are things that you can fix without going all the way down to racism. Um, instead, you can look at what you need to do to improve particular areas of the country, what you need to do to think about how you ensure pe uh, people have lower cost of living, they have greater opportunities, they can see a future for their area, they can get a sense that government generally cares about it. And climate policy is part of that, especially on energy, energy decarbonisation. The biggest the biggest kind of challenge that we saw in the most recent election in the UK was all the old seaside towns that have been ignored by government after government for decades upon decades. Um, how you support those towns is, I think, going to be key. Um, and that is a th through funding for adaptation, because some of those towns will be threatened by sea level rises. You will need jobs there to build um, new, new sort of flooding defences, um, new amenities to, uh, for the additional population and so on and so forth. You will need to find ways of um, encouraging culture to flourish in those towns as well. There are it's not all seaside towns are created equally. Margate is now a hub for hipsters, for example. How do you um, replicate that across Hastings, across Clacton, and, and changing the features of these towns so that they can feel as though the government is on their side, and that they don't, and, and therefore the cli and climate policy is on their side too. Am I allowed to? That's it. I mean, I think we're all, what do I think? I think it's early days after the election and we're all rehearsing how we feel about the results. I think the first thing to note in the context of the UK election is if you look at the number of people that were voting for populist parties, it's roughly the same percentage as the number of people that were voting for UKIP in 2015 and then Brexit in 2016. So I don't necessarily think is a kind of new force in UK politics. But I do think there's something about the fact that we've obviously not resolved the issue for a large group of the electorate who feel left behind. And I think Adam's wording there is right. What I would say is you can look at the US and other places for lessons learned about what works and what doesn't. So, for example, we talk a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act having been extraordinary in terms of, you know, in my world, the Inflation Reduction Act has driven factory consents up, often in red states in the US, by sort of five times the amount of before the Biden administration. We're seeing, you know, record numbers of trainees for things like onshore wind jobs, you know, booming industry there. It's had a deflationary effect on the US economy. And this is my way of telling you that the economic measures have worked and they've delivered the sorts of things that Adam talked about, but they are not getting rewarded for it in the polls. And so, yes, we have to do the economics and I think the economic argument is actually quite a powerful one. People turn to populism when they feel let down by their governments. And so if you can have better cost of living, hope for the future for people, a growing economy, that is a that is a legitimate way of tackling, tackling a populist threat to you know, democratic institutions. However, 
I think there's also a cultural thing happening in the way that we talk about those benefits, the language that we use, the people that we use as representatives of this sector. We need to think quite carefully about all of that. And I think those benefits have to be as local and visible as possible. It needs to be like, you know, your mum has a job, your brother, you know, the, it has to be in the community and very visible, big employers, you know, in region. And in that sense, Ben Houchin's quite interesting for the Conservative Party because he's kicked the poll average for the Conservatives in the UK and, and done reasonably well. And that is that was what Houchinism was all about up in um, the North East. So I think we don't know. It's quite early days. This isn't a new phenomenon, but it's certainly one to worry about. And the thing that I worry about most, just to finish on this, is people tend to characterise rising populism as something that is kind of an older demographic. It's not. You can see it playing out across ages and in particular there's a lot of people aged 18 to 25 that are voting for populist parties because they don't feel hopeful about the future in their uh, democracies and they don't think democracy delivers so the last thing I would say is whatever we do we have to like demonstrate that democracy can deliver some stuff and that's why so much of our message from industry because we want to deliver on net zero, because we want to grow the economy, but also because we quite like growing up in a democracy. <laughs> a lot of us are kids. We we want to see real, real delivery and as much of that to be visible and tangible for people as possible. And so it's a kind of collection of things, but it's, you know, in those buckets, I think we've got the solution to that, that threat. Sort of, sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Molly. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's also interesting, right, because a lot of the rhetoric from more populist parties around sort of anti-climate is not actually necessarily synonymous with those who are voting for those populist parties. So at the moment, there's an idea, but we've got the opportunity to kind of prove otherwise, because it's not an actual idea that resonates in any kind of real tangible way. And I think it actually comes back to the prior question that was posed by um, the colleague from Climate Outreach around public engagement as well. This needs to be something that is a socially lived experience. So, you know, I can go back to my parochial anecdote of I was at my aunt's 70th birthday in Devon recently. And my aunt comes running over to me and she says, we got our heat pump. We love it. Thank you so much for telling me about the grant. I'm getting all my friends to get it too before it expires. You know, and, and that's a silly example, but... We have to have these things living as something that we exchange with one another and that we see the benefits of. And we have quite an amount of road to run to be able to, to prove concept on that and to show those benefits. I think the example that um, Emma gave in the, the Northeast is a really good one. These things can work and can resonate. We just haven't done it yet. But I do think we need to invest in the sort of um, the resources to be able to explore to support the social mechanisms that come with the economic and practical choices that you have to make around your homes. Word of mouth continues to be the most powerful politics and, and that doesn't disappear with social media or anything else. And we've really got to be able to be um, aware of that and be thinking about all the different stratas of society and how those um, communications and engagement will go on. There is money, for example, to do investment in energy efficiency and electrification in um, lower income households. But I don't think we've got that social piece quite right to really feel the benefit of that. But frankly, anyone who spent time in an, a well insulated or electrified home thinks it's pretty cool and it's quite enjoyable. Um, and that really does start to catch on when you start talking about it with other people. Uh, the next question is from Flossie Boyd, who said, what precedent setting offer could Starmer go to COP29 with in November when the big need is finance? Could Labour be proposing an innovative taxation option, uh, e.g. polluter pays principle? Camilla, we might jump straight back to you and then I might get Simon to give his two cents too. So I think the UK is going to be under a lot of pressure to play a big leadership role um, with the other donor countries. We're in a context where the US election will have just happened. The EU is obviously regrouping post their elections and post the French elections. Um, and also the biggest donor, which is Germany, has elections looming. So the UK will be seen as sort of a bit of a point of stability um, and will be looked to definitely to try and navigate those very challenging politics of that replacement of the 100 billion goal. I think we do have some interesting track record about what the UK has done for innovative tools, particularly looking at things like guarantees and how we've worked with devel development banks to, to shape um, their way moving forward. So 
absolutely i think if there's any kind of innovative um tax related components that the uk wants to be doing at home i definitely soft typification is something that's coming up more and more and more as a conversation so that could enter the discussion and and be be part of it in in some way shape or form um but yeah it's not is not the easiest thing. We don't have a big political mandate in advanced economies for sending huge amounts of money abroad because of the the constraints that we're under. But we do need to be thinking about the transition as something we need for our domestic and the international context. And therefore, what are the opportunities that we have to work with third countries to think about the investment potential and the the growth and development that they do so it's going to be a really tricky discussion because it will be in the context of the UNFCCC and those kind of political dynamics but we're also having this big conversation about okay what does the economics and politics of the future look like and those things haven't quite come together so managing that and threading that needle is going to be really challenging but certainly yeah the UK will be very much in the spotlight for delivering um that kind of unity within the donor group and um that can be expected of us very quickly so it's something we're going to have to think about how we step into Simon yeah I mean I, I... I don't want to get too much into the details of the, the climate finance target that's going to have to be agreed at COP. Um, you know, Camilla's set it out very well. It's a real challenge because there's, you know, many developing countries that just want to see lots more public finance from, from the developed world. And the developed world is saying, well, we we simply can't do that. And it, it's not totally clear, clear yet how that's going to be, that circle's going to be squared. I think just for the Labour um, government now in the UK, what, what I think that's quite interesting and you know, perhaps a bit tricky for them is that I think they were probably like like everyone else expecting the election to come right before the COP, and they were going to be turning up, and then you know their their kind of big you know rash of exciting new announcements that they would make as a new government that that could have overlapped with with the COP period. They could have gone out to COP and said, guys, we're we're going to stick to our target of of banning new off, um, new North Sea oil and, oil and gas licences. And they wouldn't have really had to go into too much detail. It could have just been part of that kind of exciting moment. Now they're in this slightly tricky position where they've actually got quite a few months ahead of the COP. And I think, as Camilla says, there's, that's going to put a much stronger spotlight on, on details. You know, they're, they're going to be expected to have something substantive to say about climate finance, but uh, you know, across all of the issues that will be coming up in Baku. I mean, I think that puts them in a difficult um, position. Um, I'm I'm just going to use my my uh, the fact that I'm speaking to to cheekily uh, insert a question of my own. And um, we talked about populist populism and you know the politics of the transition and the need for for things to be real and and tangible for people as they experience them on the ground. And I mean, obviously, for Carbon Brief, we're watching the media coverage of, of all of this stuff very very closely every day. Um, and we've really noticed the shift over the past couple of years away from kind of, you know, outright climate scepticism is, is much less common now than it, than it was, but with, with the exception of people like Reform. Um, but what the newspapers have been doing is, is doing a lot of um, attacks on climate solutions, things like heat pumps and electric vehicles. And I'd just be really curious what the panel thinks is the role of government in, in that kind of mix. Like, should the government be kind of stepping in and saying, come on, you know, Daily Telegraph or whatever, that's a load of nonsense. Or, you know, how, how's, how should that be playing out? I'm going to attempt to get fired again for making a joke about how newspapers cover heat pumps. Um, I... So you're right, Simon. I mean, what there's a couple of interesting things happening. First, as I said, I'm hearing much less... There's a there's a kind of virtuous circle between government message, business and the media. And, you know, the last government gets talked of as being sometimes kind of, you know, less ambitious on climate change than the assumption that the new government will be. But, you know, I can remember the difference it made having a home cop in Boris Johnson you know, pushing for green measures in as, as prime minister in how business then spoke to the government and kind of advocated for net zero and for these solutions and how the media then covered them. And so I do think government often underestimates how effective it can be just having someone that prioritises talking about net zero in, in then how that kind of rolls through the public debate. 
I worry that the learning that government will take from the election or from rising populism is actually, you know, backing away from talking about climate and net zero. And I'm undecided, actually, about whether that will make the problem worse or better. But it's notable that we haven't heard much about climate change in any of the incoming speeches of the new government, despite having pretty ambitious policies on the solutions. So that's that's just something to know on the solutions themselves. You know, it's to pick up on what Camilla said earlier and some of the comments in the chat about, you know, how how do people feel about these measures? And I would say this, wouldn't I, because I'm the pro market voice. But actually, I think some of this is about making people feel as if these technologies are actually going to benefit them. So, you know, in policy terms, that means more incentives, less regulation. You know, you, you can get people to have these technologies in their homes and deliver immediate benefits. So they go and tell their neighbours that they work. Solar PV is deployed in clusters in the UK because people have seen them on roofs and they see their neighbours benefit and they want them. And a lot of our electrification technologies are held back by a market which doesn't make electricity cheap or by things like planning restrictions that stop you easily putting in a heat pump. And I, I think as with all technology rollouts ever, if we can get a market that enables people to have them and to benefit from them, you'll start getting a virtuous circle. Um, you know, coming back to newspaper coverage, I have an electric vehicle. So every time I see a headline on electric vehicles not working or range anxiety, I know it's nonsense because I've got one and it's massively beneficial and cheaper to run than a than an IC vehicle for us and really reliable. And I've done long distances in it with two kids and all of that. The more people that have these technologies and are benefiting from them, the less relevant the newspaper headlines become. And very lastly, yes, I think we should be correcting headlines. I spend a lot of my time doing it. I can't, you know, there's like, it would be nice if occasionally, you know, others did too. And I hear on the grapevine that the easiest thing to do there is to make sure that the if you see anything that's really egregious or inaccurate in the press, that, that we have got independent press regulation that you can contact, um, you know, places like Ipsos and ask for kind of corrections in the press, you can write letters to the editor, you can make clear that, you know, you want to see positive stories. So I think, you know, there's there's a job for perhaps government to do there, but actually for all of us to do there as well and making sure that we're um, working with the fourth estate to get the coverage that we want in the newspapers. Do you mind if I come in there as well? Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Emma has just said. Just want to make a couple of other points. Firstly, um, I'm not sure we really do want um, the, uh, the, the Desnet's press office to be spending a lot of time rebutting stories, because generally speaking, that means putting a relatively anodyne quote at the end of an article that basically says government still likes this, whatever you say, which is unhelpful. I think the single, uh, I think the other important thing, and this goes to Emma's point about how create a more personal relationship with these technologies is important. Um, it's for a poor government to bypass the press entirely. The single best intervention I've seen from a government minister on energy policy for the last couple of years, media terms, was Grand Chaps showing people on TikTok how to turn down the flow temperature on your boiler. I will admit the band to buy a heat pump and do TikToks on his journey as he installs it, what it does for his bills. I want them to do the same for EVs and for all of his junior ministers. Without that sort of approach, of something that directly speaks to his life and therefore the lives of and the voting public, I, d I, I don't think you'll see the sort of traction that you, you should otherwise get. Just to say, I think I'm pretty sure Ed Miliband already has a heat pump. He has a heat pump, yeah. <laughs> he's preempted the inevitable press questions he's going to get as Secretary of State for Energy and Net Zero, and I think he's already done it. But obviously you haven't heard about it, Adam, so he hasn't quite done the job that you're hoping. Oh yeah, for and TikTok, I'm sure he's done it there. There's a question back at you, Simon, about whether or not you think, you know, the traditional media is one way that people get their information about these technologies, and it is obviously important. But as Adam said, so many people get their information on social media, all from, you know, bespoke bits of journalism like Carbon Brief. And I wonder whether you think that actually the concern that we all have that's directed at the traditional media and the broadsheet press and broadcast is the right place to be putting our communications attention or whether you think a new approach is needed for us the journalists i mean that, that is such a tricky question you know i i think it's generally accepted that that television is still massively important for for many people in terms of how they get their news um uh you know and the, and and the print media you know the traditional media is obviously really important and, and shapes the the conversation you know for for politicians and you know and the public um, so, I, you know, I don't think we can just kind of say, oh, well, everyone gets their news off TikTok. So let's look there. But, I, you know, so, I, you know, I, I guess I would say this. I think it's, it's important for, you know, publications like Carbon Reef to continue 
providing you know high quality fact based information you know for the public for other journalists for you know for people in government um but you know it, it's very clear that there are huge kind of place, spaces out, out there you know on youtube on 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 you know on tiktok and so on where where there's just a, an absolute massive or a mess of of climate skepticism and you know salute climate solutions skepticism and you know you know i think it's, it's probably not not giving away any state secrets to say that you know we haven't really gone there as carbon brief and it, you know it's something that we do think about as to whether we should do but it but it's just such a you know kind of a big new world out there that you know it's pretty challenging to think about how you would even go about doing that you know i think i think one of the big challenges with it is just that you know the, the whole the, the old adage about a lie spreading halfway around the world before the truth's got its trousers on and it you know it, those posts go viral because you know they're kind of comforting lies or whatever way you want to put it and you know boring fact checks that set the record straight are simply not going to fly on youtube or, or tiktok or whatever so that you know, that's a challenge for for fact checkers, you know, at Carbon Brief and and everyone else. We have a question from Adam Vaughan at the Times that sort of uh, builds on um, Adam Adam Bell's point about um, whether or not Miliband could engage TikTok a bit better. Um, do you think the government's approach to encouraging people to move from gas boilers to heat pumps, low carbon heat, will be different to the last government? Are you expecting anything different in terms of grants like the boiler upgrade scheme, planning rules, the CHMM or timeline of a boiler ban? So in terms of the actual policy framework, the um, planning regulations for um, heat pumps are due to change. The existing um, restrictions on it being too close to the edge of a property and restrictions around noise and so on and so forth are likely to fall away. I think that's very, very positive. I mean, that was under the previous government. They just didn't talk about it. Um, I think what you will see from the, uh, from the new government is much more public enthusiasm for what they're seeking to deliver, where Ed Miliband has already publicly said that he likes the clean heat market mechanism. And I'm sure that means he will now ultimately lay the regulations for it, which are still waiting to happen and were somewhat forestalled by, uh, forestalled by the election. I think you don't actually need that much new policy to make heat pumps work now. The clean heat market mechanism and the boiler upsuit scheme, plus reforms to the planning system, should be enough by themselves. It's just about pushing them to make sure that they do occur overcoming the objection of the gas boiler manufacturers and saying, yes, this is happening and you all need to get with the programme. Can we add um, one thing on to that list? So, so Times Journalist who asks, you are, no, we're not expecting anything, dif you know, hugely different. All of those things are things, as Adam said, that are in train and should just be done. And heat pumps are so nearly there that you don't need a huge amount. The biggest difference between the UK rollout and what's going on in Europe apart from the, the actual physical fact that we've got more people on individual gas boilers in the UK than in other countries is the spark gaps. That's the gap in our electricity and gas prices. And if, if you want people to have a, you know, electric vehicles or electric heating systems, then you need to make them as cheap as possible, as early as possible. And increasingly heat pumps are like a good option because the cost of electricity are coming down. But if we can do some reform to how we, put policy costs on energy bills, which all sit on electricity and not on gas or on electricity and not in tax, then there's a chance to make heat pumps cheaper earlier. And so we're advocating, there's there's various ideas for, call, it's called rebalancing. So just moving some of the costs that currently sit on electricity bills into either taxation or you know, some other method for, for reducing the, the price for electricity which is artificially higher than gas. And then there are all kinds of other proposals for bigger market reform you know, perhaps later in the parliament that this government could start thinking about with the ex express intention of making very cheap renewables feel cheap to consumers <laughs> using electrical products in their homes because they are, but the, the kind of consequence of our policy and market design means that people don't always feel that. And I think there is a market-led approach to decarbonisation, just like the rollout of mobile phones or other technologies previously that we are have not been able to get going because of kind of policy and regulatory barriers. So there's a there's some some early thinking on that too. And a new government often has the grounds to do innovative stuff on policy where, you know, a, a tired parliament may not. So everything Adam said, plus I'd love to see some stuff on policy costs. 
Um, we've had quite a few questions on food and agriculture, which we haven't touched on a huge amount. Holly Foster asked, Labour has acknowledged that food will be a major challenge and we've seen ambition for food 2030, but what initial steps are needed to support a just agri-food systems transition for our farmers and landscape stewards? Um, Camilla, I don't know if you have something you could add on that. I'm afraid I, I, I won't on that one. Um, Adam or Emma, would either of you be able to jump in? So I think my is, is that this, sorry, Emma. Um, you get that. <laughs> is that this is about the um, land use framework that DEFRA has been uh, been under work uh, for quite some time. Um, fundamentally, in the U in the UK, we have a slightly um, strange relationship with the land. Um, we put, we think of farmers as it uh, as its steward in part, but um, we're very happy to mandate exactly what they do on the land relatively centrally um, in DEFRA. And this relates not just to ag uh, agriculture, but also relates to, as we discussed earlier, on climate adaptation. It relates to how we ensure that we are um, sending pylons through the right cor uh, cor corridors of the country. Um, as well as what you do on the trade-off between bioenergy, which can be critically important for different parts of the sector, against um, uh, against uh, agri-food. I think there's a kind of an innovation component to this as well. Currently, we use a very large amount of land for uh, uh, producing food. There are an awful lot of more innovative players that are using smaller patches of land, but with highly energy-intensive methods for producing a lot of food here. So there's a number of vertical farm companies already where that represent a big chunk of our energy demand. There's lots of other sort of polytunnel pro uh, projects that are doing, doing something similar. And I think there is a choice between to what extent other is the role of um, agriculture to maintain landscapes that we know and recognize for food production? To what extent is it uh, its role to become industrialized, to mass produce foods, and therefore leave more scope for rewilding? And to what extent is its, is its role to grow food around the wind turbines and pylons that we're going to need for the transition? These are the questions that, again, that um, DEFRA are delving into and have been delving into for some time. I, I think Labour's um, thinking here Will take some uh, some time to develop because these are hard questions and do need proper consideration. Can we talk about the energy that goes into the food system as well? Because that's the other bit of the equation. So we will. I mean, most of us are energy specialists on this course. So I'm sure. Uh, though actually, Adam's answer was pretty comprehensive on food. I was going to say I'm sure that you can get a kind of detailed answer about land use from from others. The the two big drivers for climate change and for kind of emissions are either land use change or the energy production from fossil fuels. Energy um, emissions from fossil fuels are still by far the biggest challenge in the economy, which is why we're kind of focusing on it so much. And But that does include energy emissions from other sectors of the economy, such as food production and the manufacturing of things like fertilizers for industrial food production. The thing to say here is one of the reasons we talk a lot about electrification across the economy and across the energy system is we know that you have to decarbonize other areas of the economy which are harder to abate, such as um, food, industrial processes, manufacturing. And in those harder to abate bits of the economy, we're likely to use things like hydrogen to manufacture lower carbon fertilizers and so on and so forth. And so I think it's really important that we're thinking systemically about decarbonisation and energy use across the economy when we're thinking about the use of things like hydrogen or electricity or kind of clean power, um, clean fuel inputs into the economy. And for food in particular, a lot of the shift for farmers will either to be to have on-site power generation from renewables to be thinking about things like they're called power purchase agreements and more direct purchasing of clean power from power generation. This applies also for other kind of heavy energy intensive bits of the economy. Um, but then also to be using things like hydrogen and low carbon fuels where we can't do it with electrification. And that includes for things like manufacturing fertilizers. And so there's a big energy component of the food and farming debate that often gets kind of forgotten, but it's a big reason that food emissions are high and why the costs of food are going up as well, because the costs of, of energy have gone up in the last last two years. So these are interrelated systems and you can normally find energy at the bottom of them. Just to jump in quickly, I mean, this isn't just important because of food and because of land and nature and all, all of those things, but it's also important for, for emissions. And um, as, as of last year, some analysis we published in um, in March, I think it was, um, agriculture and land use is now a bigger contributor to the UK's greenhouse gas emissions than the power sector, which is you know pretty amazing. And it just shows how much progress we've made in terms of phasing out coal. 
Um, but that means that, you know, that those other sectors are now increasingly important. Yeah, and Simon, so, mean, that's why we talk so often about things like electrification for heat and prioritising hydrogen and other kind of fuels for those tricky to abate bits of the economy because they're getting a bigger and bigger chunk of our emissions footprint. I emphasize that you can now buy a very good electric tractor if that was a concern. <laughs> Have you got one yourself? I think that's my. And it can be. I can't justify a large, a large electric tractor in East London. Maybe it should be man mandatory for the deferred minister. I hear we've got a transport, a transport minister who owns two buses. So I think you know, electric tractor for for one of the new environment ministers. I would love to see an electric tractor tractor TikTok. I'm sure it exists somewhere. Guaranteed to exist. Um, I am aware that we're running up against time, but I might try and squeeze one or two more questions in if that's OK with the panellists. Uh, we have one from Frank Gordon's uh, Jordans, who says, can the UK still become a clean tech player or is it impossible given Brexit? Um, so sort of building on some of the points that Camilla's made, leaving aside how advanced decarbonisation is, why should countries look to the UK on green industrial policy given the small scale of the economy compared to the US, China and the EU? Camilla? So, yes, we can't shape those geoeconomics in the same way, but we can be best in class to be copied. And that's the rule of thumb going forward. We have the opportunity to work closely with the EU as well. That geography matters. As I said before, we share the North Seas. That's going to be incredibly important for energy security. We have a number of technical components that we have to address in those in that relationship, particularly around electricity trading, to be able to make the investments that we're going to need. Um, but we can work closely with the EU going forward um, to explore different opportunities. We will make choices to align. We will make uh, choices to diverge. And those things are, are completely le legitimate. But at the moment, we're making many choices through distance, not design, to diverge. And I think I'm really hopeful about the opportunity of building a um, stronger relationship with the EU again to be able to move forward on, on climate and energy and related um, issues. In terms of technologies, absolutely, we have the opportunity to be part of this, particularly around the grid, particularly around interconnection. Um, we are down the track, we are going further in the transition. So that means that we get the opportunity to be at the forefront and, and make some choices and make some opportunities. That doesn't mean that we do them completely on our own. It might be that we do that with partners in the EU. It might be that we do that with partners with other mid-sized um, countries, if that's Japan, South Korea. We've got big opportunities there to work with others around the world. And it's completely consistent um, with any other transition or any other technological innovation that we've been part of before, that we attract investment and expertise from, from other partners. But absolutely, we've got a, a market. If we're, we're sharing, sh sending those signals of commitment to really rapid decarbonisation, then we become a hub for that. And we should absolutely create the space and opportunity for it. Again, that um, coordination with big powers, particularly our friends in the, in the US and also the EU will be important vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with China. It's still unclear what relationship um, with China this new government is going to have. We know, and I have this exercise with people, some, there's some idea that China is too involved in the transition. And I get people to say, OK, look around this room that you're in. Is there anything in here that's been made in China? And of course there is. And of course, China is going to continue to be entangled in our economies in different ways and in the technologies. But there's some choices to be made about how we manage that. And that will be a really critical set of choices that the new government is going to have to make vis-a-vis -vis technology and, and the way that we take the transition forward. Um, can I, this question, we get this question a lot and I always feel about it in the same way as people, it's, you know, you, you've all met my children now. I, I often feel like it's like if a parent, as a parent, you were not teaching your other children, like your children not to hit people because it's like, you know, only on the basis that other people didn't hit them. <laughs> you know, there's a kind of, some things are just the right things to do. Firstly, we should say that climate change is a reality we should do our best as one of the world's biggest economies to tackle our emissions and tackle the way that we live, which has driven so many of those emissions. And that's just, that's a, the right thing to do. But for the for the kind of non-altruistic, you know, reasons for doing it, we've got the biggest, one of the biggest offshore wind markets in the world. And we'll maintain that position because we've got a flat North Sea and really high wind speeds. I think we've got 
kind of second or third best wind resource on the entire planet in this windy wet island. So there will be a leadership position for us on wind. It, that is partly the reason that we've managed to drive emissions reduction in the power sector. But the other is that we've got really well dealing governance here. The Climate Change Act, the Committee on Climate Change, the underpinning legislation, I understand people's scepticism on it. But nevertheless, it is world leading. It's been copied by hundreds of countries worldwide and it has delivered progress, not least the phase out of coal from one of the you know, founders of the Industrial Revolution faster than anyone thought possible and the delivery of cheap renewables faster than anyone thought possible while the light stayed on and mostly the public stayed with us in that journey. So I think the governance... Um, piece is something the UK is good at and we could show leadership on again there's all kinds of questions about how you do green financing how you do you know carbon pricing how we track consumption emissions how you do adaptation well that our markets and policy lend itself to to being copied internationally I'd add the CFD our contract for difference auction for renewables as well you know has been copied internationally so there's something like in the geek space where what we do here does matter and can be replicated and then I think there are technologies and opportunities here where we have world leading industries where we can transition them earlier. And we've talked about green steel already, but also hydrogen, carbon capture. We've got world class aquifers here because we had an oil and gas industry, so potential for storage of carbon. We've got a ex fishing or and existing fishing industry that can be repurposed to do things like boats out to offshore wind and already are. You know, you've got harbour infrastructure, port infrastructure, shipbuilders, composites manufacturing, low, uh, cable manufacturing, loads of areas where we're world class already. And I think, you know, there is we we tend to kind of have this conversation as if what does it matter these are big global industries and the earlier we move the better the last thing i would say is the thing that camilla has said and we said earlier that we are further down the curve on power sector emissions in other countries we also have a society where people use a lot of energy in their homes in transport systems and we are a developed economy if we can demonstrate how to electrify that early and how to carbonize it early and how to make the two ends of the system work together that is our contribution to other countries because we are going to be one of the first countries to do it and do it well I think and that again can then cause other countries to have the confidence to follow if you go early you get the industrial benefits the jobs the growth and the industries in country though and that's the reason apart from the altruism that we should go go faster but yeah there's loads, I mean yeah, that question there's loads of reasons the UK can still massively benefit from doing this even if we're small and windy and rainy and, you know, kind of, you know, cynical and tired, there's still massive amounts of hope for us here. So, you know, don't anyone tell you otherwise. That's a great note to sort of pull the conversation to an end on. Um, unfortunately, we are pretty much out of time for today's webinar. So just to finish off, I'm going to ask one final question just to get some concluding statements from the panellists. So this is the first change of ruling party in the UK for 14 years. What do you think that means for climate action? Adam, should we start with you? Well, quite frankly, given that Ed Miliband is back in what back in what is now basically the Department for Energy and Climate Change, basically the 14 years have passed, nothing has happened. So um, I think we get, we've gone back to square one, we've gone back to 14 years ago, and I think to a degree, that can only be a good thing. Camilla? Um, Thankfully, a lot has happened over the last 14 years. Um, I definitely heard Adam sarcasm there. Um, I mean, I think that the, the shake-up is a really good opportunity. I think that, uh, you know, contrary to actually what the Conservatives were saying over the last year or so, they actually did achieve a lot. I said a lot of civil servants also achieved a lot through um, the last few parliaments in terms of making progress on the transition, but they did a lot of the easier stuff. And I think having an, a government who has the energy and the appetite to grasp this and to really try and make government work and use it as a tool for doing good things is just so exciting and something that I think we're all calling out for and really has a lot of potential to really, as an individual, as a citizen of this country, benefit me on that level, but also benefit us more broadly and be able to set a really fantastic precedent for how we move this forward. We're going to make mistakes. And I think it's really important that um, 
we don't hold the UK to a ridiculous standard, which means that we are not allowed to make mistakes. We've never done this before. We will make some mistakes. We will go backwards and forwards. But ultimately, if we really stay focused on those missions and that objectives of what we're trying to achieve, I really think that we can provide a real um, value add to the people of this country, but also more, more broadly to people around the world. Emma? I think it is a very challenging 10 years ahead for all the reasons we've talked about in this call. But unlike the 10 years, 14 years before, we absolutely know that clean energy technologies are cheaper than fossil fuel technologies. And we have demonstrated things in delivery that we didn't think was possible, you know, back in the 2010s, such as an offshore wind industry, such as cheap power prices such as 70% renewables in the mix with secure supply. And we should take that as hope for the next phase of decarbonisation because we've now done it before. And I think with a energised government and with discipline across Whitehall that we can succeed. And I think the big litmus test of this government is not you know, brand new ideas, it's delivery. And by far the most optimistic thing I've seen in the last you know, four or five days was that, you know, is the Chancellor giving a speech with like half the cabinet there? And I realise that's because they haven't yet got like 99 invites in their diaries for doing other things. But it's also a statement that when they're saying things like planning reform or clean energy mission, that there's a chance of driving that across cabinet and across Whitehall. And that's important because we have got some kind of complex system challenges and trade offs in this decade that we haven't had before. But I suppose. I mean, the last answer I gave you is the one to finish on, which is I am really, really hopeful about what the UK can still do. And I think there is this inclination to give in to a kind of cynicism or a weariness or a, you know, that we, or a sense that we've done the easy stuff or the, the fact that the impacts are so clearly with us and, and give up all hope that we can have an exciting 10 years ahead. But I fully intend to. So I hope other people do, too. Fingers crossed we all do. Um, well, a massive thank you to all our panellists for joining us today. Um, apologies to anyone whose question we didn't quite manage to get round to. I think all in from all the different sources, we had just shy of 200 questions. Um, we will be publishing a recording of this webinar on the Carbon Brief website, so keep an eye out for that if you're keen to revisit the session or share it with your colleagues. Um, after, beyond that, thank you to everyone who has joined us this morning, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.